I'm with Mimi Rosmarin from Mayor Panim. Now, Mimi, what is Mayor Panim? Mayor Panim is a network of social service. What we like to call them is really restaurant style soup kitchens and full social service safety net opportunities for people in five cities around Israel. So we provide meals mostly, but as people come in and and we see the other needs they have, we also provide different things to help them, people in need, really um, get a leg up and help them get back on their feet and break the cycle of poverty here in Israel. How was the organization started? So the organization was starting in, in the year 2000 by two gentlemen, one that had a daughter that was very ill when she was born and, and she needed a feeding tube. And after going through that experience with his daughter, he wanted to give back after she became healthy and make sure that anyone that was in need of food specifically would have a place to go. So we started here in our Jerusalem branch with one branch in the year 2000, and 23 years later, we've expanded to five branches, which is incredible. Is this people that are lonely, or is it people who are homeless? It's all. We actually, over the last two years, we've seen a real increase in homeless people, particular here in Jerusalem. As you see, we're located very close to the central bus and railway stations. And unfortunately, with the rise and the increase of people in poverty, we have seen for the first time in our 20-year history that there are homeless people living on the streets around us. And we've started, actually, about a year ago, two nights a week serving homeless people in their in their places on the street we have young amazing volunteers go around with grocery carts and heated blankets and bring them food in the evenings two evenings a week are there a lot of people that live on the streets so we're serving about 80 in this area so yeah it's really awful to see and and it's a new phenomenon that we're seeing in jerusalem what does mea panim mean in hebrew so it means mayor panim is the, the literal translation is to brighten the face And that's part of our ethos, is that we do everything here with dignity and respect. We want people to come in to our centers, feel like they're a part of a family, feel like they have a safety net, feel like they're being taken care of, so that they can leave with a brightened face and they can move into their lives with confidence so that they can have the ability to break out of the tough time they're in. And this is the vulnerable people that you're helping, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what what we love about what we do, and I think what makes our place really special, is that people come in and there's no questions asked. So we don't ask to see if they're on welfare. We don't check anything about them. There's no criteria. Anyone can come in and sit down and be taken care of as a part of our Mayor Panim family. And so what people ask, you know, how do you know they're really in need? How do you know someone's really poor when they come in? And, and what I've said is you're not going to walk into a soup kitchen if you're not actually really poor, either mentally or physically. So we want this place to be a refuge for anyone. And whereabouts are you based all over Israel? Yes, we have five branches around the country, Tiberias and Svat in the north, a little town called Orkiva, which is adjacent to Caesarea here in Jerusalem, and we also have a branch in Demona. And in addition to that, we have teen programs to help teens at risk in the Gaza border town of Steyrot. Now, you're giving food out to people, but do people come and bring you food and give you product as well? So we are so lucky in so many of our branches. We get tremendous amounts of donations from restaurants and events halls and hotels just here in our Jerusalem branch. There's a hotels, you know, we're surrounded by hotels here, really, and we get donations of full pan, full, you know, those um, hotel pans of frozen food, and we get all of the produce at all of our branches from an organization called Leket Israel that we partner with. We have a tremendous amount of products that are donated through an organization called La Tate, which works directly with food producers, the big factories. And so we get a lot of donations, and we also have a tremendous amount of in-kind donations from volunteers that come in. We have such a lean staff, and each of our branches, it takes a village to help the number of people we're helping. So um, we definitely rely on donations and volunteer time. Have you been surprised at how much food that you've been given? No. (laughs) Unfortunately, before COVID, until now, we really used to rely almost exclusively on donated food. Um, So three, four years ago, our kitchens weren't equipped really to 
make food at all, just to really warm up food. And in the pandemic, when all the hotels and events halls and restaurants were closed down, we had to really shift our operations so that we had to learn how to really, first of all, buy food, which was difficult for our budget, and then cook it. And we had to retrofit all of these centers with proper cooking kitchens rather than warming up kitchens. We put in, for example, in two of our branches here and in our Orkiva branch, like walk-in fridge freezers, just tremendous amount of work. And since the pandemic has waned, thank God, we're still cooking about half and being relying on donations of prepared food for about half. COVID must have been very difficult for you and for your clientele as well. Yes. You know, in Israel, the poverty rate went up double since March 2020. And really in that period of time, we were in this just crisis mode. Mm. People were out of work and not receiving their unemployment benefits yet. People couldn't leave their houses. As I mentioned, we transformed all of our operations from warming up restaurants to really cooking. And now what we're seeing is we're not really in a crisis mode anymore, but we're in a challenge of this new normal. And I'm sure, Paul, as you see at the grocery store, the price of food keeps going up and up and the poverty rate in Israel keeps going up and up even since COVID. So what we're seeing is more people that are coming to us because they need help because they can't afford groceries, but we're an organization that takes care of food (laughs) for people. So we're really facing that economic challenge on both sides right now. What percentage of Israelis live under the poverty line? So one in five Israelis are living with food insecurity right now. 27.8% of Israelis are living in poverty. And then 233,000 more families now are living in economic hardship than before the pandemic. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah, it really is dramatic. I think Israel was known for really handling the COVID crisis very well in terms of the health and the death rate and the numbers. But one thing that we really are seeing the the long-term effects are the economic challenges that went along with such such extreme measures and so many days of lockdown. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you help Holocaust survivors? Absolutely. So as I said, every branch of ours is a no questions asked policy. And unless our clientele, our patrons that come in want to share, we don't ask them any questions. In our Demona Center specifically, we have a day program where 40 Holocaust survivors come in three or four days a week, depending on the week. And from 8.30 in the morning, they are welcomed with a large breakfast spread. They have activities. They have all kinds of um, health and wellness and socialization opportunities. They have a nice lunch at 1.30, and then they go home around 2 for the day. And in each of our branches, we know there are Holocaust survivors in the community that we're taken care of. We just don't have specific numbers because we just welcome everyone in. Do they share their stories at all? Some, some do. I think in Demona, absolutely. And I think what we're seeing now is the Holocaust survivors that are still living with us were quite young. Mm. So they don't have such vivid memories, but what they have is generational trauma. Mm. What they have is the experience of moving to a country, and many of them, especially in our Dramona Center, never were able to learn Hebrew. So about 80% of the survivors that we see are Russian-speaking and are really, you know, have long-term economic challenges from experiencing that in their childhoods. Are your workers here all volunteers? So in each of our branches, we have one or two paid staff. Everyone else is either community service workers or volunteers. It's incredible, especially in our Orakiva Center, if you're ever able to go. Almost every week, they have school children, like from sixth grade and below, that come in and help cook and sort and serve. In our Demona location, every week we have kids in 11th grade as a part of a identity building program called Masa Israeli, like Masa is like a journey, where they have 11th grade kids come in every week and volunteer as a part of their curriculum at school. Are some of your clientele just, just lonely and this is like a highlight of their week because they get to meet other people? Absolutely. We love that. Something that we've really loved having since COVID is that our centers can be a refuge for people. Again, I would say most people don't come in here that can afford food otherwise, but they'll come in, they'll sit. Our centers are all air conditioned or heated based on the season. So it's a comfortable place. I like to think of it as like their hangout or a place where they can go where they know they'll be greeted. They'll see a friendly face, volunteer staff, and even some people come in here and sit next to the same people at lunch every day. So it is, yes, for some people. 
What about those people who can't come? Perhaps they're old and they can't come. Do you provide care packages for those at home? Yeah, so we have three ways that people can be taken care of through Mayor Penny. The first, which is our favorite way for people to come in because we get to see them, we get to check on them, we get to treat them with dignity and respect. They get a refuge from their day. But we also have people that come in and pick up and take home. You'll see people coming in with empty Tupperwares and that'll come in and take back. And also there are people that are that have their meals delivered home, especially people that are older and, and a little bit um, mobility challenged. Do you do something special for Shabbat? Every week. Yeah. So our center is open Sunday through Thursday. We're not open on Fridays and Shabbat. And every Thursday afternoon here, you'll see downstairs, I'm actually looking at our cameras, there are bags of halas that are given out and extra food given out so that our patrons can enjoy a festive and beautiful Shabbat, even though we're not open to be able to provide that to them. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about Starot, uh, which is very close to the Gaza border. Yes. So Steyrot is an incredible city, the main Israeli city that is the Gaza border. And what we do there is we run opportunities for teens at risk to have what I like to call stealth therapy. So they come in and they go to do woodworking workshops and other kinds of identity building activities, which for them is just a fun kind of hangout opportunity. But really what our staff there are trained to do is to help them emotionally and socially deal with the with the challenges of living in stereo. One thing we know about the city is that 70% of the residents there have PTSD from some of the trauma of living with those kinds of rockets and in that neighborhood. So we have trained staff that are there to help pull out some of the emotion that the teens are feeling and some of the risky behaviors to be on the lookout for and to give them the ability to be together, to feel pride in where they live, because it is quite amazing and brave for a community, a city, to say, we're not gonna abandon because of fear. We're gonna hold down this fort in pride of Israel and to be able to do things that actually benefit the community. They volunteer, they deliver flowers to elderly people. They were lighting the Hanukkah menorahs with them in the winter, delivering matzah and care packages in the spring before the Passover holiday. So what our goals are really there is to give the kids a place where they can go be, have community, and give them pride um, so that they can feel stronger. And it's so difficult near Starot because you only have 15 seconds to get to a bomb shelter, isn't it? Yes, all of our locations are located in bomb-proof locations. So the kids know when they come to Mayor Panim, they're going to a safe environment. And their parents actually, I think, even more appreciate that because it's very normal in Israeli communities for kids to like hang out in playgrounds and parks and just walk around because the weather's so temperate. But in Stay Road, that's something that is adds another level of anxiety for both the kids and the parents. Do you help all backgrounds, Muslims, Christians, and Jews? Absolutely. Everyone is welcome at Mayor Panim, and we have volunteers of all faiths and recipients of all faiths. One thing that I like to say is that we are in tune with all of the calendars of all the different people of faiths that live in Israel. So, you know, while it was Ramadan, which just ended this week, we were aware that our Muslim faith patrons weren't going to be able to eat lunch and we were delivering them more meals or doing more takeout so that they can eat it after the sun went down. We're welcome to anyone, any language, any denomination, any faith, any anything. And I think that's a really unique spot here in Israel, which is such a politically charged place to have a refuge for when all are welcome and everyone really gets along, which is really amazing. It's just the language that supersedes any of that. It's really special. You're doing all this work, a huge amount of work. How do you fund all this? <laughs> so 80% of our funds are coming from overseas, from outside of Israel. We're a 100% privately funded organization. So we have incredible fundraisers in many countries um, that help us and just incredibly generous people that support our work and want to be a part of the global peoplehood, which are helping people in Israel, both Jewish people, Christian people, peoples of all faith that really are saying we support the growth of people in need and people in vulnerable positions here in Israel, and um, it's incredible. How long have you been doing this, and why do you do what you do? So I um, moved to Israel with my family about five years ago, 
And about four years ago, when it was time for me to start looking for work after as a mom and the wife, I settled everyone. I started looking for a job which would feel both meaningful and could provide, obviously, income for our family. And I found this job through Nefesh Benefesh, which is an organization that helps Jewish people that are immigrating to Israel with English-speaking jobs or jobs that are, are kind of suited for a different kind of experience than local Israelis would have. And it's been the greatest blessing of my aliyah, of my moving to Israel, because I've been exposed to so many different kinds of people. I've been able to give back as part of my work, and I've been able to you know, get in the car to our different branches and see all kinds of work happening. So I say that like Mayor Panim has been like my personal Olpan, my personal Hebrew class and my personal Misrad HaKlita, which is like the Ministry of Absorption. So it's been incredibly rewarding for me personally to be a part of this. What do your clientele, the people who actually use your services, think of Mayor Panim? They are a huge range. What I love about our patrons is that they're comfortable enough to complain <laughs> when something isn't right. And they are so happy to have a place to go and people taking care of them. And they're also so happy to tell us how we can improve, like real Israelis, <laughs> pointing out, you know, I didn't like the chicken today or this rice was dry. And, you know, that's how you know you've really made a place where people feel at home and comfortable. Yeah. So, yeah. I think they just as often as complain, they'll give you a hug while they're complaining and say thank you. And just they're so grateful and happy to be able to have this, th their place. What's your hope for the future? I would say like my big, hairy, audacious goal is to not need to exist anymore. Um, you know, Israel's celebrated at 75 anniversary yesterday, 75th yesterday was Yom Hatzmaut Independence Day. And the first 75 years of our history has been about really building the nation and securing our borders and living in a bit of, I would say, like overall crisis mode in and out of periods of peace and war and challenges. And I hope the next 75 years of this country can focus more on the social issues and really helping to decrease the number of people that need to come to Mayor Panim. So I would love to see Mayor Panim branches close and to be out of a job, because that means that the people of Israel are not in need of this kind of help anymore. What's your website for people who'd like to know more, perhaps want to give? Yes, so you can visit our website at Mayor Panim, M-E-I-R-Panim, P-A-N-I-M, dot org, dot I-L. And if you just type into Google Mayor Panim, we would love your support. We would love you to follow what we're doing. We have websites for our British audience also, which everything's in English. So you can read and if you're able to donate, you can donate with a UK tax receipt through our British office. And we're just so grateful for you listening to our story and serving as an ambassadors for the land of Israel overall and for people in need here in Israel. Okay, Mimi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure.